Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, and I'm a professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This is another proof in my series on proofs in differential calculus. And in this proof, we are going to go ahead and tackle the Cauch inverse. So I want to prove that the Cauch inverse here is equal to this junk on the right hand side. Now, this is typically how textbooks write this uh, theorem. But I tend to find that it's a little bit easier to write the theorem uh, with y's. So I'm going to say instead that Cauch inverse of y is equal to the natural log of the, oops, not the square root, I was going to say the square root, but y plus, and then the square root of y squared minus 1. I want to use y's just because we're going to be graphing things a little bit and, and I want to make sure that the proof is obvious. There are a few things we need to know prior to starting this proof. And they are uh, that you need to know hyperbolic functions and their graphs, like I mentioned a moment ago. You'll have to know the quadratic formula because I'm going to use that within the proof. Uh, you'll have to know logarithms and properties of logarithms. And you'll also have to know that um, the implications of derivatives uh, for increasing and decreasing values. So we're going to take some derivatives, or a derivative, and we're going to note that that implies a function is increasing or decreasing. So that's the stuff we need to know beforehand. Let's go ahead and get started with the proof. The first thing I'm going to do, and remember, I'm actually working not with the Cauch inverse of x, but I'm working with the Cauch inverse of y1, just because it makes my life a little bit easier. And, and you know what, before I begin, I'm going to go ahead and graph the Cauch function. Well, no, you probably won't understand why. So let's start first with the proof. So we first start with letting x equal the Cauch inverse of y because we don't know what the Cauch inverse of y is and we want to prove that it equals the natural log of that business. So I am eventually going to mangle this somehow to find out what x is in a different form rather than just saying it's Cauch inverse of y. But starting this way helps out because then we can say that y is equal to uh, the Cauch of x. And every time I say the word or the phrase Cauch of x, you should be hearing me say the hyperbolic cosine of x. Uh, I know some mathematicians yell at uh, people because they say Cauch all the time, but it is the hyperbolic cosine. It's just faster to say Cauch. Now something I want you to remember about the hyperbolic cosine graph is that it kind of has this, a lot of students think it's a parabolic look to it, um, but it's just, it does kind of have that look to it, but it's not. Um, but anyway, it has this look to it, and it has a range of 1 to infinity inclusive of 1. So the problem is that this is not naturally invertible. If you look at this, uh, if you tried to invert it, you would, you would, would it wouldn't be invertible at all, because it doesn't pass the uh, horizontal line test. So we are going to have to restrict the domain here, the values of x that we are going to consider. And a great restriction is to consider only x values greater than or equal to 0. So I just went ahead and said that, and I also erased the left half of the hyperbolic cosine graph. Now let's go ahead and start playing with that y equals cosh of x business. Just by recalling the hyperbolic function for uh, the or for the, the, I'm sorry, the exponential function for the hyperbolic cosine of x, lots of words there, uh, we know that y is going to equal this e to the x plus e to the negative x all over 2. Now remember my goal is to find out what another version of x is. I don't want to just write x equals cosh inverse of y. So I'd love to f solve this equation, this is an equation, I'd love to solve it for, for x, really. So let's go ahead and kind of simplify this a little bit. I'm going to multiply both sides of the extremes, the left uh, um, side and the right hand side, by 2. And now when I look at this, remember I want to solve for x, but because we have two different functions that x is wrapped up in, there's really no hope right now. We can do a little trick by multiplying both sides of that equation by e to the x power. And then when we do that, we'll get 2y e to the x must equal e to the 2x 
plus one actually it's actually kind of nice and I'll go ahead and since we still have two terms that involve X's I'll move everything to the right hand side so this will imply that we have uh, 0 equals e to the 2x minus 2y e to the x plus 1 and if you look closely that is a quadratic like function it has the format of a variable oops I shouldn't use y there as a form the format of a variable to a square plus some number times the same variable to the first power plus some number. It does have that quadratic look to it which tells me I can use the quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and use the quadratic formula. Remember our goal again is to find out another version of x. So if I use a quadratic formula here I get that e to the x is equal to 2y plus or minus the square root of 4y squared minus 4ac but a is 1 and c is 1 all over 2a but a is 1. Okay, this actually will simplify down quite a bit. So e to the x will just equal y plus or minus the square root of y squared minus 1. Now remember where we actually want to go. We want to get that x is equal to the natural log of y plus the square root of y squared minus 1. So there's something wrong here. Specifically, we see the minus part is something we want to eventually get rid of there. So we need to make an argument against that minus sign. So let's go ahead and consider e to the x equals y minus the square root of y squared minus 1. We want to get rid of that, remember. We only want the plus business. So let's give ourselves a reason why we need to get rid of that. I'm first going to note three things that we know for certain about uh, y's and x's here. The first two are from our um, assumptions earlier, the fact that we had to restrict the domain of the hyperbolic cosine so that x was always greater than or equal to zero. The second one comes from the fact that we know what the graph of hyperbolic cosine looks like. It starts at a height of one and goes up forever. And again, you can look back here to look at the hyperbolic cosine. It does start at a height of one and goes up forever. So those are the first two things. But that x being greater than or equal to 0 gives us a little bit more. That tells us that e to the x is always greater than or equal to 1. So that's going to be what, I, what I'm going to use to throw this out. Now, a lot of textbooks will tell you, well, huh, y minus the square root of y squared minus 1 is uh, less than 1. So just assume that and walk away from it. But they don't give you a reason behind it. And I want to give the reason behind it here. So we need this to be greater than or equal to 1, right? e to the x, again, is greater than or equal to 1. So this statement should be greater than or equal to 1. And I just kind of paraphrase that right here. Also, I want you to know that that y minus the square root of y squared, squared minus 1, that's equal to e to the x. And remember, our x values are going to range from 0 to infinity. So our x values are not, are not just going to stop at zero. They're going to continue on forever. That's important to note here. So this, uh, these, these values, well, I'll, I'll show you why, that, why I say that. Because if you let y equal 1, we get in this statement here, 1 minus 0. And that definitely equals 1. Great. That's good. Now what we hope is that for y greater than 1, that this gets bigger. And I went ahead and wrote that here. We just need that statement, y minus the square root of y squared minus 1, to get larger as y goes bigger than 1. And this is where I'm going to debunk this. This is where I get to throw this out. I'm just going to create a function, g of y, that equals that y minus the square root of y squared minus 1. And I'm going to take its derivative. Turns out when you take its derivative, it's going to turn into 1 minus y over the square root of y squared minus 1. And I'm going to tell you right now that this is always negative. That's my claim. Uh, I'll, I'll explain why in a moment, but let's just first concentrate on the fact that let's just assume that, that what I'm telling you is true. So if this derivative is always negative, that implies that g of y, well maybe I should qualify this, it's always negative 
um, if y is greater than 1. It's always negative if y is greater than 1. What does that mean? It means that g of y is decreasing, right? A negative derivative means that your function, your original function, is decreasing. So it's decreasing for y greater than 1. Well, initially at y equals 1, we were, our output was 1. That's what we wanted, and we wanted to increase from there. But guess what? If this claim right here is true, it won't increase. It'll just decrease because our derivative is negative. That means we're decreasing away uh, from 1. So let's explain why that derivative is negative. And in this explanation, I'm going to appeal to your sense of... Um, your sense of understanding of fractions. Maybe that's how I should say it. Well, would you agree with me that 1 is equal to y over y? I sure hope you do, <laughs> right? And for y greater than 1, or basically for positive y values, that is the same thing as y over the square root of y squared. You should also agree with me, right? Square root of y squared is just y. For y, that is positive. Okay. So, so far I haven't done anything magical. The next part will seem a little bit weird to you. So I'm going to first kind of prep you for it by saying, if I have 3 over 3 versus 3 over 2.9, which fraction is larger? Well, the answer is 3 over 3 is 1. 3 over 2.9, that's actually larger than 1. That 2.9 over 2.9 is 1. 3 over 2.9 is actually larger than 1. So shrinking that denominator actually grew the number slightly. Shrinking the denominator grew the actual fraction slightly. So that claim is if I shrink this denominator down here, it'll actually grow this fraction. So I'll keep the numerator the same, but I'm going to shrink the denominator just slightly y squared minus 1. So I've shrunk it just a teeny little bit. I've subtracted 1 from the inside of the square root. Just a little bit of a shrink there in the denominator, but that definitely means this fraction is now bigger than all the previous work. In other words, that 1 is less than y over the square root of y squared minus 1. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we subtract that fraction from both sides of this inequality, we get the following. 1 minus y over the square root of y squared minus 1 is less than 0, or in other words, negative. What did I tell you earlier? That the derivative, which is 1 minus y over the square root of y squared minus 1, is negative. Again, that's if y is greater than 1. Right? And th that actually does uh, was part of my assumption here. I was saying that y was positive. So that is uh, that that is why it's negative. There you go. So uh, this tells me that the derivative is negative, which tells me that g, this function right here, is decreasing. And it started out at a high. It started out as at one when I plugged in one, and from that point forward, it just decreases. It doesn't get bigger. And the problem is we need it. We needed it to actually be bigger than one. We didn't want it to decrease and go lower than one. So that allows me to throw that out right and this is just me rephrasing this that that y minus the square root of y squared minus one is just below one when we allow y to be bigger than one so i'll go ahead and rephrase that again this is my proof so i want to that was all my scratch work over there um, that i can reference to i can just say hey if you don't believe my next statement go look at my scratch work so I say, but x being greater than or equal to 0 implies e to the x is greater than or equal to 1. And we know that from what we've just done. y minus the square root of y squared minus 1 is always less than 1 for y greater than 1. Hence, we have e to the x must equal y plus the square root of y squared minus 1. And by the way, because y is greater than or equal to 1, you know that this uh, first object gives us at least one plus we have a little bit more and so we uh, we know that this is going to be greater than or equal to one always it's going to end up growing as time goes on 
So now we can go ahead and take the natural log of both sides. If we do that, we get that x is equal to the natural log of y plus the square root of y squared minus 1. And lo and behold, we now, since x was the cosh inverse of y, we now know the cosh inverse of y must therefore equal the natural log of y plus the square root of y squared minus 1. That's an entertaining proof. A little bit of a uh, head swirling on that one, but we got through it pretty okay, I think. QED. Oh, uh, that's